In this yellow box is a piece of equipment that's going to give us more information in our reloads than we've ever been able to generate before. Today, we're going over the Pressure Trace 2 system. I'm going to do my best to explain what this is good for, what it might not be good for, and show you some data that we generated with it. So let's get started. Full disclosure up front, I paid full price for this unit and all opinions about this review are mine. Frankly, I don't think this is a tool that most people really need, especially if you don't have a chronograph. That's certainly first on your list. I purchased it primarily to provide a little more information and some of the reloading content that I present. I've been getting multiple questions about the data sets I've generated with it, and I thought it deserved its own video. Right out of the gate, let's start off what it's not for. The Pressure Trace 2 system does not duplicate SAMI or CIP test methods, and it is not a replacement for those tests. The Pressure Trace system is not designed to determine if ammunition is safe or not. Don't look at the data we provide and decide that, oh, it looks like I can start going outside of published load data. It's not what this is for. Why the heck would I buy it then? I want to be able to provide you a visual idea of what's happening during the firing process and how it relates to our results on target. When it comes to pressure, right now the best tool that I had in my arsenal was quick load. It's not a bad tool, but it's a calculation. It's not necessarily real life. If I change primers, I would like to be able to show you what happens. How does the pressure curve change? I strictly plan on using this as a comparison tool. If you think this is something you might be interested, look in detail at the manual that's posted online. I really encourage you to read it more than once to understand what the system is and exactly how it works. I found that most of the questions I had about the system were in the manual, but I had to go through it a few times to find them. Real quickly, let's go over this tool. The heart of the system, in my opinion, is the sensor itself. These are strain gauges that measure the expansion of the barrel during the firing process, and this is going to translate to pressure. The sensors that I was provided with my unit were about a half inch by an inch and a quarter. And you'll need one for every barrel that you intend to use it to test. They are one-time use only, but frankly, after you've bought the system itself, the sensors really aren't too bad. Depending on how many you buy, I believe they're under $40. The system that measures these sensors is in this yellow box. It's a very clean interface, and your computer has to connect to this unit through Bluetooth, so it's wireless. Except for a cable that has to connect the unit to the sensor. The sensor is connected through an extension wire to the cable to the box. So overall, the hardware is pretty simple. Like I mentioned, it is a Bluetooth interface. The microcontroller inside it is clocked at 20 megahertz, and it accepts an input from any standard 350 ohm, five volt or higher rated strain gauge. This unit collects data every 10 microseconds, and with every firing, it collects 300 data points. The resolution of this unit is measured in micro strains, and frankly, I believe that's because, depending on what your barrel diameters are and the caliber you're shooting, is going to be what determines the exact pressure that you can resolve. The pressure this unit is rated for is anywhere between 300 and 80,000 PSI. Personally, I would just power it with the AA batteries that it's capable of, but the directions say that it can accept a cigarette lighter or a power point from a wall transformer that's 9 volt DC. But make sure you pay attention to your polarity. One crucial point about this device, and depending on your caliber you're intending to test, is exactly where you can attach the sensor. The sensor you need to attach is about a half inch by an inch and a quarter, and pay attention to the directions for exactly where you can attach it. On my 6.5 Creedmoor, I have it just over the neck of the case, only because my barrel nut is interfering with putting it up any further. However, even though that's where I attach it, I seem to be able to acquire good data. The software that comes with this device is installed off of a CD-ROM, so if you're using a laptop that doesn't have a CD-ROM, you're going to need an external one to use it. And once you have the software configured, you're limited to 10 rounds on the same file. So depending on your case, this may hamper your testing a little bit. There may be an alternative to this that I'll cover later in the video, but I haven't tested it yet, so your mileage may vary. Let's see what this little box can do though. Today's test is going to be on 6.5 Creedmoor, and we're using the 130 grain Nosler RDF. These haven't worked very well for me in the past, and they continue to disappoint as far as group size is concerned today as well. But we're really not talking about group size, we're talking about pressure. And they're going to work perfectly to show exactly how this guy works. I will throw our load details on the screen so you can see. This is Lapo Brass, five times previously fired, my standard reloading process, annealing, full length sizing, mandrel, all those details. We're going to be running a ladder test starting at 41 grains, going up to 44 grains in 0.2 grain increments. This does exceed the load data from Nosler for these projectiles. However, we are extending our cartridge over length to 2.800 inches compared to their book data of 2.775 inches. Quick load today is going to insinuate we are over pressure as well. However, comparing this to Sierra's data for the 130 grain tip match king, they're not exactly the same, but they are similar, is going to give us data above that 44 grain mark. Our standard reloading practice of stopping when we see pressure signs is going to be in effect. 
we are certainly not relying on our pressure trace to tell us what's safe and what's not. Again, we're looking for comparative values. Now to me, one of the biggest confusions with this system is calibration. I truly plan on using it for comparative purposes, but knowing relatively what pressure you're at would be nice. And at this time, if that's what you're looking for, I can't be too much of a help. If you'd like to use a program like Quickload to calibrate it, you can insert an offset, but let's look at our data to see if it really makes any sense. Before we fired any of our reloads, I wanted to start off with some factory ammo. So for comparison's sake, we used some of Horny's 143 grain LDX Precision Hunter ammunition. Our first round is on a cold, clean barrel, and we can see that our first round gave us a pressure of about 47,000 PSI. Again, this is not corrected. We can see that our second round hit a max pressure of 49,703 PSI. So basically, 50,000 PSI. Assuming that 6.5 Creedmoor's max case pressure is 63,000, we can insert a 13,000 offset and be done. But I'm really not sure that that's the best option. Some other users of this unit have talked about using Quickload for it on online forums. You're going to have to make your own decision. I'm not sure that that's a perfect idea either. Plugging our data into Quickload, we're going to see that its estimated pressure is going to be starting at 53,335 PSI, and our max charge at 44 grains is going to increase all the way up to 66,684 PSI. But because we have no offset plugged in, that certainly isn't going to be the case for what we measured. If you look at our first 10 rounds, these are again our shots starting at 41 grains, going up in two tenths of a grain increments for every single test. And we can see, generally speaking, that as we increase our charge weight, the pressure does increase a little bit. We'll put our next six shots on there, and we can see that the trend continues. One takeaway for me on this particular chart, on our max charge, our peak pressure reached 50,204 PSI, not significantly different than our factory round. So for fun, let's throw up a quick chart that's going to be what our quick load estimated pressure minus our measured pressure is. We can see at our lower charge weights that our differential is somewhere between like 11 and 13,000, but as our charge rates gets higher, it seems to increase to around 16,000, with our max difference being a little over 18,000 PSI. If you want to average every single one of these data points, it's just over 14,000 PSI for our application. Let's add our velocity data into the mix. I wanted to make sure you could still see all the numbers on the chart if possible, so the estimated velocity is just the line, but our estimated velocity is going to start off at 2787 feet per second and max out at our top charge at around 2977 feet per second. Keep in mind this is a 26 inch barrel, so these velocities are not really unexpected. And as far as quick load goes, it actually matched up pretty well. At 41 grains, our velocity start out at 2780 feet per second, and our max charge at 44 grains, our max velocity measured out at 2960 feet per second. So to me, it's very interesting to see where those velocity increases went up and down, and how the measured pressure varied in accordance with those numbers. Our lowest measured pressure was 40,819, and as you can see on the chart, increased all up to 50,204. Again, no correction factors have been applied. So quick load's estimated velocity, very close. But you can decide for yourself about the pressure data. As we do more testing with this, I wonder if it's going to be possible to use these charts to identify nodes based on pressure even more than velocity. But only time will tell. Another feature of the software that comes with it is if you enter your measured velocities into the program, it will calculate where your exit points are in comparison with optimum barrel time data. So it's there if you're interested in it. Personally, I haven't made my mind up on exactly how important that feature is. When I was doing research on this system, it appears that there is a community that wanted to remove this 10 round limit that's imposed by the software. If you're to Google Gordon's reloading tool, more specifically GRT Trace, there's a free software package that I believe can be used with this device. To be honest, I haven't explored it yet, but it is on my list of things to do. So if you have one of these and are thinking about picking ones up, you might want to look into it. The more we use the tool on the channel, the more we're going to learn about it. If you'd like to see how this equipment was able to measure the pressure changes as we changed the cartridge or length of our loaded round, as well as identified a possible problem with our test platform, make sure you check out this video right here. If you'd like to help make more of this testing possible, please consider supporting the channel here on Patreon, and I hope to see you come back next week. And until then, stay safe in small groups.